Board of Supervisors and Chair of TISDAC. And I'll move now to Cindy Mester. Is, if Cindy's with us. I'm not sure if Cindy's here. She... Uh, I think maybe she was going to be out of town for, for okay. this. Um, let's see. Uh, can I ask the other members of uh, TISDAC to introduce themselves? Brian, maybe you can start with us. Good morning, I'm Brian Booth. Um, I'm the director of Blacksburg Transit and representing CTAV. Great, Noel. Good morning, my name is Noel Pinker and I'm the organizational advancement officer for Hampton Roads Transit and I'm representing the Virginia Transit Authority. And welcome. Thank uh, you. Jim, uh, Jim Dyke. Yeah, Jim Dyke from McGuire Woods Consulting and I'm here representing uh, the RPT, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see, uh, Kate Matice. Good morning. This is Kate Matice, Executive Director of the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, uh, here on behalf of the Virginia Transit Association. Jamie. Good morning. I'm Jamie Jackson. I'm the Director of Transit and Transportation for the City of Fredericksburg and Fredericksburg Regional Transit, representing DRPT. And I know I'm missing somebody, but I can't see all the names Dr. on the list Smoot. here. Dr. Smoot is out there somewhere, I believe. Oh, Dr. Smoot, yes. Is he there? I saw him sign in. Not sure if he's the able Dr. to Smoot? present. I don't know if he was put in as a presenter or not. Uh huh. Have I missed anybody else? I don't believe so, sir. All right. Great. And uh, uh, Zach, um, maybe you can start off with staff who's here. Oh, uh, sure, sure. Uh, so, um, Andy, if you want to introduce yourself real quick, and then we'll go uh, Tiffany and then Grant and then Dan, who's all Spartan speaking today. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks again for your patience. Got to love technology. Um, this is Andrew Wright, Chief of External Affairs at DRPT. I'll go ahead next. My name is Tiffany Dubinsky. I'm our Director of Transit Planning with DRPT. Good morning, everyone. Grant Sparks. I'm the Director of Statewide Transit Programs for DRPT. Great. And Dan, I think. Dan, do you want to, you're going to be speaking, so if you want to. Dan sure. Sonnenklar. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Sonnenklar. I am a Statewide Transit Planning Manager here with DRPT. All right, great. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, patience as we get started here this morning. Um, we'll begin with the approval of the March uh, 28th, 19, uh, 2024 uh, meeting minutes. Uh, uh, does anybody have any uh, corrections, amendments, uh, um, questions about the, the minutes? Move to adopt. Motion to adopt the minutes. Uh, and uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any objections? Minutes are approved. Okay. Uh, today we're going to start off with uh, um, information about the General Assembly. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong sheet here. Zach, I think you're going to give us an update, aren't you, uh, as our first order of business today? Yes, sir. I'll just uh, I, I kind of set the stage for what we want to talk about today. This is we sort of just call it a meeting. It's not necessarily one of our regular meetings, but um, and I guess first, good morning to uh, to everybody out there. Gosh, it's uh, I hope it's as beautiful everywhere it is, as it is here in in Richmond. Um, and thank you, Chairman McLennan. Uh, so it looks like yeah, we have a lot of people. Thanks to all of of you on TISDAC for for making time today. And then we have um, you know over looks like forty some other people out in the agencies and everywhere else. So thank you all for taking the time to tune in and and participate today. Um, Part of the reason that we're meeting today is to address concerns about funding going into fiscal year 26 and 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 beyond. Um, as as I think all of you know, our, our funding is determined by uh, the percentage of overall transportation revenues, and then our programs are driven by a performance based formula that that allocates that funding. Uh, the funding allocations the last few years have really been impacted by the the one time revenues that we have received from pandemic funding. It was, it was good impacts. You know, they, we received, a, I guess you could say a lot of money. There was significant, significant funds put into transportation. Thankfully, it helped us to weather some of the impacts of the pandemic. Um, but these one time revenues you know, are 
have been in some cases are just are being exhausted. And so our funding levels for programs are returning to, I'm, I'm not going to use the word normal because Lord knows what normal is any, anymore, but uh, to previous levels, you might say. So um, one problem with that is in, in many cases, the costs that increased due to some of this are not returning to previous levels. And this is causing concern about the funding that, um, you know, is able to be put into the RPT programs versus the costs that are now still being borne by by agencies out there. So um, we thought within this environment, it would be best to, you know, given TISDAC statutory, uh, you know, requirements or responsibilities and, and the representation you all have uh, for the, from the various <laughs> transportation stakeholders to get you all together to, to look at this, you know, in the current environment and to hear some of the concerns that we have around this issue. So um, that clear as mud. Uh, I just wanted to kind of set the stage just for what we want to talk about. Um, and uh, so that that's just, so yeah, we're, we're here to talk about some of the concerns and to, to gather information and, and go into that. And um, so I'll leave it at that. So does anybody have any questions for Zach, for Zach uh, before we move on? Okay, I hear none. Thank you. So. Let me also uh, mention that uh, uh, Dr. Smoot, we went through a roll call. Just uh, want to make sure folks know that you're on the call as well, uh, representing Thank Commonwealth you. Transportation Board. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we'll move on. Uh, and I think we have our first uh, presentation by Dan, Dan Sonnenclar, uh, who's going to be speaking about uh, the Merit Operating Assistance Review and Outlook. And are you going to be sharing your screen on this one? Yes, thank you. So uh, I am not sharing my screen, but can you all see the slides that are being shared by Jayla? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so good morning, everybody, and thank you all for attending today. Uh, again, my name is Dan Sonnenklar, and I am a statewide transit planning manager here with DRPT. Uh, today, I will be going over a review of both our capital and operating programs uh, with a little bit more concentration on the operating program, uh, delving into a little deeper also into our five year outlook for, for both programs. Um, and this is intended to kind of frame up some of the issues that we're facing and get a little bit deeper into some of those issues that we presented at our last meeting in April. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so starting with the merit operating assistance program. Um, this is just a kind of a reminder and an overview of, of, of DRPT's program review process and schedule and TISDAC's involvement in that. Uh, just as a reminder, this committee, the, the TISDAC, is designated by code as the official advisory committee to DRPT, providing uh, you know, advisory uh, information to us, but also to the CTB. Uh, and with regard to the operating program, this body may choose to make overall recommendations to DRPT uh, regarding the operating assistance formula and program parameters, as well as on the Commonwealth Mass Transit Fund uh, funding across all transit program areas, including the operating assistance program. Uh, DRPT is assigned by code to review the operating assistance program and recommend needed changes to CTB every three years. Uh, with regard to pro the program formula, eligibility, and the funding cap that we have implemented. Um, so this three-year review is meant to be done with the input of TISDAC, transit agencies, MPOs, local government, and local governments prior to making any uh, uh, kind of program-wide recommendations. So we're queuing up a few issues here that we've identified um, as we prepare for this review. The last review that we completed was in 2022. And so we are, are looking at starting this review uh, next year. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this slide here is essentially where we left off in our last uh, presentation to this committee. Uh, the overall issues that we see facing the operating, operating program are, are summarized here. Uh, and that's that just what Zach said is that over the past three fiscal years or so, um, operating assistance revenues have exceeded projected levels due to one time revenues in the program. This resulted of course, in very high allocations in FY 22 and 23, uh, which continued into 24. Uh, and in 25, which is the year that we're in right now, uh, the program was funded uh, still above normal levels or projected levels due to the addition of some additional one-time revenues 
that we were able to shift over to the program through project de-obligations. Uh, even so, a few agencies received less funding in FY25 compared to FY24 due to a combination of really just kind of the dynamics of how the uh, performance-based formula uh, functions. Uh, so this is the sizing and performance metrics that each agency um, have reported to us compared to the rest of the state and rising operational costs, which can increase the kind of the, the maximum amounts allocated to high performing agencies in the program. And if you all recall, we went over the, the dynamics of the of the mathematics that are involved in the formula uh, in the last meeting. Uh, starting in FY26, DRPT expects that revenue will come back to projected levels uh, through the formula by code. And based on this projection, um, and the projected decrease in total revenues available in the operating assistance program, uh, some agencies should prepare for the possibility of yet lower allocations uh, next year in FY26. And those agencies that should prepare for that are the ones that were either close to uh, seeing a decrease in FY25 compared to 24 or those that it did experience a decrease in FY25 compared to 24. So this is the overall uh, uh, issue kind of facing the program um, as we come out of the pandemic and return to, uh, as Zach mentioned, the new normal levels. Next slide, please. So the dynamics that I just described are illustrated on this slide. Um, and uh, sorry for the graininess, I think, on the on the last few um, uh, bars on this chart. I will I'll explain all of the colors and, and various different symbology here. Uh, so on this chart in, and on all other charts in this presentation, uh, the FY 2019 to 25 values are actual figures uh, that are were reflected in our six year plans and our allocations to agencies uh, and FY 26 to 30 are projections into the future, uh, which are generally il illustrated with striping and that's what's showing up a little bit grainy in those in those last five bars. Uh, the dark blue color represents new state operating funds on this chart that came through the CTB or that are expected to come through the, C uh, so I'm sorry, the CMTF um, uh, in future years and in past years. The lighter blue bars illustrate one-time revenues that were available within the program and that were distributed to agencies. So starting with FY20 here, I'm just going to step through the, the, the kind of history of the program here. Uh, that was the first year that we launched the merit programs and the new operating assistance formula. Uh, we saw a small increase in new revenues available as expected, uh, but we also saw a, a, a large increase in additional one time revenues of $11 million uh, due to some COVID relief funds that DRPT was able to provide to agencies in April of 2020, just after the pandemic started. Moving into FY20, there was a further increase in the new funding available um, as the 2020 omnibus bill uh, went into effect, um, but there were no additional revenues in the program that year. But in 2022, the new funding continued to grow as dictated by that omnibus bill that was passed. Uh, but in addition, we had a significant mid-year uplift that became available for operating uh, that was equal to about $57 million which allowed the total program to grow to $165 million, which was an all-time high for our, for our uh, operating program since uh, WMATA has been removed from it. Uh, this meant that we were able to provide every agency in the state with their maximum allocation in FY22. The next year in here, in FY23, uh, we also saw significant CTB discretionary funds that were directed into the operating assistance program, a total of 48 million extra um, one-time uh, funds were, were shifted into the program, and we were able to provide agencies that year also with the maximum allotments across the states. Moving on to FY24, which was last fiscal year, we saw a significant drop in the total funds available from the COVID highs because we did not have those significant uplift uh, funds coming through. Um, however, uh, DRPT did have an additional $11 million in carryover funds that exceeded the 30% allocations given to each agency in the prior two years. And so most agencies that did not hit their 30% cap, 
they did see a small decrease compared to previous years, but it wasn't uh, um, uh, widespread across the Commonwealth. And in this year, in FY25, we were able to keep the program funded at a similar level to FY24 to, due to a small carryover balance and by shifting, as I mentioned a moment ago, those deobligated funds over to the program. Um, but there was a small decrease, and this decrease was due to the fact that VRE was taken out of the capital and operating programs starting in FY25. And so the revenues came down, but also the um, the uh, amount of money that we had to allocate through the program, program came down because VRE no longer receives um, funding through the operating assistance program. And moving on to the future projected years, um, in FY26, we're projecting to have less overall in the program than we did this past year. We are projecting $119 million between new CMTF funds and a small carryover balance from this year. And uh, I'll just point out that the small carryover balance uh, just happens because based on the timing of our estimates that go into our six-year plan and when we receive uh, real allocations from, I believe, the Department of Accounts, uh, it's just uh, that doesn't happen until May or June each year. And so every year we get the actual amounts a little late in our six-year develop our program development cycle. And so we often have a small carryover balance that, that carries into the next year. Um, and yeah, well, with this uh, this past year, a slightly higher amount was allocated to the program than we had expected even in April of, of 2024. And so that is the, the overall uh, uh, kind of snapshot of the history of the revenues in the operating assistance program and what we are projecting over the next five years. Next slide, please. Well, oh, do you, I, I'll pause there if you all have any questions. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. We'll, we can wait until you finish up. And I, I will I will pause at the end of the operating um, overview here, and we can go back and 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 chat about any any details that you all want to dive into. Um, so, notably, as we've discussed multiple times, the one-time revenues in the operating formula, real or in the operating program rather, really influence the amount of money that were allocated to agencies in FY 22, 23, and 24. Uh, coming down from these 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 highs of the COVID era, but also coupled with the increases in the operational costs that we're kind of seeing across the board, it's meant that revenue coming back down in line with predict predictable levels is felt particularly hard by a lot of our agencies across the state. Uh, in order to illustrate the impact of these one-time allocations versus just kind of how the formula works, we've produced an analysis that illustrates the impacts um, to each agency across the state. And we've done this in Power BI through a tool that, that shows the, the statewide impacts uh, of the program or in the program and the individual agency impacts. Um, within that, now we'll show you all a live demo of this in, in just one moment. Um, you can find uh, two scenarios. One is the actual allocations that were seen through the six-year plan each year since 2019, which included also the off-cycle operating allocations uh, with those one-time revenue infusions during the COVID years. Uh, we also created a scenario that shows uh, what, what things would have looked like had there been no one-time revenues. And the idea here is that we wanted to just create an illustration for agencies to see what their uh, performance-based allocations would have looked like over this time frame. And it, um, if you don't mind, Jayla, I'll just take over uh, the screen for one moment here. Let's see if I can do this successfully to show you all how to navigate to this area. So can you all see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Thank you. So we'll start here. We're just on the DRPT websites. Um, and if you all have not navigated to our new open data portal on here, this is a great opportunity to learn how to. Uh, the open data portal is located in one of the tabs across the top. You would click in there and the first available tile here is our transit performance data uh, uh, tile. And we have lots of different dashboards and products within here. But the one that we're going to want to navigate to today is the transit performance data dashboard. You can either click here or click on one of the links in the description. And it brings up a interactive illustration of all of our transit data that we use 
on an, um, an annual basis. To look at the, excuse me, the uh, historic operating assistance allocations, you would navigate to this section in the bottom right and click View Historic Operating Assistance Allocations, and it brings you to this new dashboard. Uh, the dashboard here includes program description, what we're looking at within here, and if you click on Historic Allocations, FY19 to 25, you will get to this uh, data product that we've that we've created. On the left, agencies can look at either the statewide actual allocations or individual agency allocations through the filter. And on the right, it is the no one-time uh, revenue scenario allocations. So just as a brief summary here, what we can see over this seven-year period is that we started down in the $90.5 million range for actual allocations and revenues, and we bumped up to the $160 million range um, in uh, FY22 and 23. Um, if we did not have those one-time revenues, the one no one-time revenue scenario on the right illustrates what those um, um, allocations and what those revenues would have looked like. Uh, instead of 160 in 2022, we would have had 103 in 2022. Similarly, we would have only had 120 in or 119 in 2023 compared to 163. And so if you want to look at your individual agencies, you can click on the select agency filter. And for some reason it is loading there it is and you can select your agency and so here I'll, i will just click on arlington transits and it will filter out all of the other statewide agencies just to show a picture of what things would have looked like for our uh, arlington transit had we not had those those uh, uh large in, infusions of of uh revenues over over the COVID years uh, you can also download this data if you go if you go back to this description field, there is a download data button in the top right corner, which will uh, uh, just automatically download an Excel spreadsheet that you all can use to look at these numbers a little closer. Um, and so I'll go ahead and stop sharing there. I just wanted to uh, let you all know that that is available. And this was responding to some requests we've had um, externally and from this board to see what uh, what things would have looked like without those one-time uh, funds. And I, I, I do think it helps to illustrate how different the program was over the past uh, three years because of those one-time revenues. And Jayla, you're welcome to take back over screen sharing. If you just go back one slide for one second, I will just mention here, um, um, there is a link in the uh, materials that were shared with you. Uh, we have updated this slide uh, presentation, and so we will need to uh, share a new uh, PDF document with this, but the link to the data is, is also on, on this slide here. Uh, so next slide now. Okay, so in addition to looking at what things would have been like without one time revenues, we've also started analyzing how growth in operating costs statewide compared to revenue increases over the past seven years and into the next five. Uh, again, here, everything through 25 is actual. Everything uh, after FY26 is a projection. So one thing to keep in mind with this chart, however, which does make it a little bit complicated, is that operating cost figures come from our operating assistance applications, which are delayed by two years. So in on this chart, I attempt to illustrate um, annual operating costs and annual operating revenues from the state. However, the costs are delayed by two years. So for FY20, for example, the cost reflects the reflect the cost that were used in the FY20 formula run, which was actually audited FY18 data. So in FY25, the costs are actually the FY23 figures. But the reason why we kept them uh, uh, together like this is because those are the costs that are used in the formula and that influence or that that are uh, directly impacted by the revenues that are available in a given year. The overall takeaway with this slide, however, is that projected new operating revenues moving into the future are not expected to keep pace 
with the projected operating cost increases we're going to see over this time. And this is based on historic data. So on this chart, the green bars illustrate operating costs and the blue bars indicate state operating revenues. Uh, through FY23 on this chart, new revenues that the state had to support operating, for the most part, increased at a slightly faster rate than costs were increasing. In FY24, the new revenues increased slightly, slightly more than costs, and in FY25, the opposite happened. The cost increases that were used to run the formula increased significantly more than revenues. And so what we've done is we've used those growth rates over the past six years, year over year, uh, and projected out forward to, uh, to arrive at the conclusion that we do not believe that our increases over the next few years will, will uh, keep pace with the increases that agencies are seeing in their operating costs. Um, and so one other note here is that the, the uh, projected cost increases as I mentioned, are taken from an average of the past few years, whereas the projected revenue increases come from our VDOT annual projections uh, that are provided to us, and it is what's also included in our six-year plan. And so in FY26, we are expecting uh, a, a, a nominal increase in uh, the amount of funding in the state operating program compared to this year, but uh, we are expecting to see a 5% increase in the costs uh, that uh, agencies are experiencing. And so I will pause here for uh, questions regarding these various analyses that we've done and the overall kind of uh, picture that we're, we're uh, illustrating for you all. Well, thank you, Dan. It's a very uh, thorough uh, and uh, somewhat depressing uh, situation that we're looking at here, but um, uh, does anybody have questions for Dan? Yeah, this is Jim Dyke. I have a question. Um, as it relates to the, to the merit program, uh, we, we, we've been hearing from a couple of folks about perhaps looking at the uh, fact that we do have some excess funds in merit and that maybe we ought to be shifting some of those to operating needs. And I was just wondering, I just wanted to get some feedback from other members of TISDAC and from DRPT on that thought. So uh, that sounds like it was more of a question for the for the members of this committee. If you all want to address that, um, and uh, uh, Mr. Dyke, when you when, when you say uh, uh, additional funds in the merit program, are you are you referring to other other transit programs that are not the operating program to shift those over? Uh, well, at, at, at that's what I wanted to get some elaboration on as to how how that particular idea, uh, the impact of it, and how you would accomplish it, and is this is this a viable thought for us to even be considering? So um, we'll get a little bit into the capital program, and the capital program does does not have a lot of. Uh, additional funds to shift, but there are other DRPT programs that that could be used for that purpose. But I, I think we should we should pause on that point and and speak about it during the discussion after this, uh, just okay. because I think it would be good to get a full picture of the capital and operating programs before getting into that. Okay, that's fine. And, and I think Dan, uh, as you're probably aware, there has been some discussion about whether there are funds available through the trip program that uh, are not being utilized presently. Um, that's been an issue that's been raised. Further to Jim's question, uh, are you saying that in the operating fund, other than what you have shown us here, there is not significant unallocated accumulated funds uh, that that could perhaps be allocated for the next fiscal year uh, yes that that is what we're saying there are other, we, we have uh, about three million dollars in in accumulated funds from a carryover from fy25 that will be uh, allocated next year to agencies right. but in the operating program we are only expecting um, what what our, our projections are telling us at this point, which is about $116 million in new funds, plus the $3 million in carryover. Thank you. 
I don't know if you see the case hand is up. I don't know if your screen shows that or not. They're on my screen. Thank you so much. Is that? Thank you so much. So first of all, uh, Danny and the team, fantastic analysis, greatly appreciated. I think it's probably important for us to remember that the inflationary pressures that are hitting every single industry in the country and probably around the world play themselves out here as well. So the growth in the cost of operating transit is probably no different than the growth of anything um, if you were to sort of look at, at inflation trends. So, um, but to me, and I and perhaps I, ga I gather a, a, a letter may have just been sent to some TISDAC members. I didn't see it before the meeting, um, but I do think it's important as, as Mr. Dyke had pointed out, there is a conversation and perhaps the big question here is, are there things administratively that allow DRBT to move money to meet gaps? Or is that a legislative fix? So we can sort of put a pin in that. Um, I think that there may be some opportunities to look at what things are flexible to be able to fill the gap in the near term. But I think my sense is that there's a, a legislative conversation that may need to come eventually when it comes to shoring up the Transportation Trust Fund. As an aside, I'd also be very interested in our colleagues at, at VDOT and others. I mean, the Transportation Trust Fund is a big thing. Are we finding that costs everywhere are are now exceeding what would originally have been projected as needs when we did the big omnibus bill in 2020? So lots of things I want to just throw out there. I think some really good opportunities to think holistically, big picture, and what can be done administratively versus legislatively in this space. And now I'm going to look at a letter. I guess it just came out. So thank you. Right. Th thanks, Kate, for that. And and I do think that uh, it is the case that when you look at those uh, projections going forward, that uh, you know basically uh, we are uh, in a deficit situation compared to where we were in terms of share of uh, uh, the cost of of transit uh, right through the fiscal year thirty. Um, uh, and uh, so I think it is important to draw attention to that. Um, let me also mention that uh, Cindy Mester, our vice chair, has joined. Uh, and uh, uh, Cindy, welcome, uh, representing the Virginia Municipal League. Thank you, John. And apologies for arriving late. Very important conversation. I concur with the points uh, Kate made about the good data analysis and giving us food for thought. Well, well the good news is that uh, because of my technical incompetence, we uh, you only lost about 15 minutes of our discussion. So. <laughs> All right, any other comments or, or thoughts, uh, or do you want to wait until we hear about the capital side? This is Jamie. I just had a quick question about the carryover. What is a normal carryover in an average year? Is it a million dollars, $2 million? Is it less than that? Is it insignificant? Um, you mentioned carryover every year, so I'm just curious what that looks like. Yeah, that's that's a great question. I, I haven't analyzed exactly what that looks like every year, um, but it is it's usually no more than a couple of million dollars. And it's just uh, it, it accounts for the difference between what the actual uh, uh, revenues came out to versus what we were projecting in the spring. And so uh, in the past, coming out of the COVID years, the carryover, we had a couple of years with very high carryover balances because we, we simply could not allocate all of the funds that we had. Um, but the normal year over year is, I would say, between two and three million dollars. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Chair, if I could, just a quick follow up to that. Mm -hmm. um, so I get the timing and the revenue. Is there any policy where you want to have a contingency, a bit of carryover for the unexpected, or is it just the timing and then it gets rolled back in? That's a great question as well. Um, in the operating program, we do allocate out everything we have in a given year, but we do maintain a capital and operating um, contingency uh, uh, account, which essentially has some rainy day weather for, for either program if we need it. Thanks for confirming my recollection. Hmm. Any other comments? Okay, hearing none, should we move on then, Dan? Sure. Um, so yeah, now we'll move on to the capital assistance program. Uh, then next slide, please. Um, we'll start here in the same place that we started the operating assistant presentation with a few point on TISDAC's role and our program review. 
Uh, notably, the capital program does not have a mandated three-year review, though we usually do take the time to make adjustments and analyze the program in tandem with any merit operating assistance recommendations as well. Uh, so the TISDAC for the uh, capital program also reviews the overall program on an annual basis and may choose to make recommendations regarding the scoring and program parameters that, that underlie the program, um, as well as the CMTF funding splits for this program and others as well. Next slide, please. And so the, the issues facing the capital program are different, but they are based in a very similar um, similar place, and that's that increasing costs across the board are putting pressures on all of our funding programs. Um, over the past three fiscal years, capital assistance revenues also exceeded projected levels due to one-time revenues in this program as well, uh, and that allowed DRPT to fund far more projects than we otherwise would have in FY22 and 23, and that continued into 24. Uh, with uh, significant carryover balances that, that kept the, the program well-funded. Uh, as mentioned, increases in costs of capital purchases industry-wide are putting pressures on the program, and starting in FY26, we expect that revenues will return to normal projected levels similar to the operating program. Um, and so this is happening at the same time that carryover balances have been spent down uh, that we've made a few multi-year obligations to large projects that will reduce the the uh, amount of funds available for new projects next year and um, there's an additional factor here that we haven't talked about much with this committee uh, but i will get into at the end of this presentation and that's changes in the rural transit program our, our federal rural transit program uh, may put additional pressures on our state capital assistance program because capital projects for rural areas are funded through both programs. And so on this chart, again, similar to the one we saw before, we have capital uh, assistance revenues over the past few years and projections into the future. Once again, everything through FY25 is historic actual values. FY26 to 30 are projected um, and, and they're illustrated with striping. And again, I do apologize for the uh, for the uh, graininess of those. Um, the dark blue bars represent new CMTF funds. That's the Commonwealth Mass Transit Fund going into the capital program. And the light blue bars represent one-time revenues. Uh, one-time revenues here, for simplicity's sake, includes all of the COVID era uplift in the program, but also the carryover balances that we brought forward from previous years and from project D obligations. Um, notably here, for the first few years on this chart, the one-time funds also included deobligated bonds that came back to DRPT through, through, through those project deobligations in FY 18, 19, and 20, and that mostly came from the Northern Virginia area and WMATA as their funding structures in the state really were changed uh, in, in the pr previous few fiscal years. And so um, we had, as you can see on this chart, a lot of one-time revenues in the program, keeping it afloat through uh, FY 21. So in the initial years, the one-time funding did make up the majority um, of the funding in the program. Uh, notably here, the FY20 cycle was the first year of the Merit Capital Assistance Program with the new match rates that we provide and the scoring methods that we prescribe. Uh, that year, DRPT had large amounts of that, that one-time money, including the carryover balances I just mentioned, but also some state funding that was shifted into the program to support uh, a few Amazon HQ2 projects in that year. And so in FY21, we received a significant PTF allocation that also impacted the, the uh, uh, capital program. FY22, uh, the C CMTF revenues really started to, to tick upwards based on provisions of the 2020 omnibus bill. And we also received significant mid-year uplift that year. In FY23, the funding levels of the omnibus bill were fully implemented, which is why the new funds went up to $80 million that year, and they've stayed pretty consistent since then. Um, and we were able also in 23, we, took, uh, uh, we had a healthy carryover balance that, that provided us over, over uh, $100 million in the program. Um, and that trend really did continue through 24. 
And in 25, the carry overbalances really started coming down and they were smaller than previous years. And the new CMTF revenues were slightly lower due to that same dynamic of VRE being kind of cut out of the program. So moving forward, FY26 and beyond, we're projecting only new CMTF revenues here um, because that is what uh, our, our best guess as to what we will have next year and beyond at this point in time. Now, each year, we always have additional one-time revenues that come into the program through project de-obligations. When a project is canceled or if a project comes in cheaper than expected, uh, agencies de-obligate that money and it comes back to us and goes back into the program. We, however, won't know that exact amount until we, we, we finalize um, our revenue estimates in the December-January timeframe. So right now, we are just illustrating what we know we will have next year and beyond. Um, I'll pause there because these charts can be quite complicated. Do you have any, any questions specifically on the data presented here? Kate does. I do. Thanks again. So one of the things I know that all of our transit systems look holistically at a whole bunch of different funding sources. Um, have you guys looked at also how well our transit systems have participated in the smart scale program over time? Because to me, I think holistically about state aid for capital, it includes both the smart scale as well as. So I'd just be curious, obviously, if you have any thoughts now, but I think that's very helpful for us to get a sense, um, especially smart scale may change over time um, and our transit system's ability to compete in it um, may or may not be impacted depending on sort of what happens. So um, my answer to that is that we haven't analyzed historically how well people are, are participating in that and kind of put together metrics on that, but we do actively encourage agencies that have big expansion projects to go after smart scale dollars. And that's been a, a consistent um, strategy of ours since I started here back in 2018. And so our, our, our larger agencies that are implementing big capital infrastructure projects are looking at smart scale for funding and trying to fit it into, into the, uh, the parameters of that program as well. Uh, but yet it is not included in this analysis or in this presentation. I think it's helpful to get a sense, especially over the last two, three years, sort of how transit has fared in smart scale. Um, I think that's a, a really helpful um, picture to add to this. And let me just add that if, if we are going to be um, looking at the, that uh, question, I uh, want to see both uh, the applications uh, uh, from transit agencies to participate in smart scale and the outcomes, because um, I think that um, we want to get a sense of what's happening uh, with those choices. And thank you, Dan, for explaining deallocation and deobligation um, terms that were new to me, uh, but uh, which I understand now. Deobligations is a it's it's a bit of an insider uh, term yeah. <laughs> here, but it's very important to understand where our money comes from. Right, right. Looks like Any Grant other comments or questions? Yep. And, and I was I was just going to quickly um, elaborate on Kate's point, and just as a reminder, I know everybody probably knows this, but smart scale is for service expansion projects only. Um, it does not uh, fund state of good repair projects, and the bulk of our state capital program is state of good repair. Um, by code, I, I believe it's at least eighty percent of our capital funds have to go to a state of good repair projects, but certainly, you know, smart scale can help with those uh, service expansion projects, especially the uh, really costly ones. Thanks, Grant. Okay, so we can and go to the next slide if we're ready. Seems like oh, it. Cindy raised her hand. Sorry, oh. my digital hand was slow. Um, I think this conversation, even if smart scale is mostly for expansion, does help with the big picture. And I think that also ties in to Dan's earlier point of, you know, giving us a heads up on what's happening with the federal uh, rural money and other federal sources that might come into this picture. Um, I know our charge is kind of looking not too narrow, but it does help us if we're looking at the overall funding and looking back at the omnibus money from 2013 and how we're going to deal with uh, the shortfalls that you're already laying out. Thanks. Okay, anyone else? 
All right. I guess we'll move on now then. think we've ever gone over our five-year capital outlook with TISDAC, at least not since I've been here. But um, this is actually a, a key uh, planning uh, project that we do every year uh, where we rely on five-year capital budgets submitted by agencies to compare projected revenues to needs expressed by our agencies. And this helps us kind of frame up what we are expecting uh, to see as far as applications um, and also to identify projects that we really need to target for things like smart scale or federal discretionary applications. And so um, I'll give an overview of, of all of the elements of this chart because I know this is complicated as well, but I, 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 I hope it makes sense after I explain it. Um, what, uh, but yeah, um, we use this for multiple purposes within within our, our programming areas. So uh, again, through 25 is actual, FY26 and beyond is a projection. The blue bars illustrate revenues in each year. And here we've combined new revenues and one-time revenues into one color for simplicity's sake. The light blue lines and dots indicate the needs. So through FY25, the need represents the annual allocation through the capital assistance program. FY26 and beyond, those needs come from the aggregated five-year budgets that are submitted to us by our agencies using our normal match rates. And so one of the things we have to do in this process is try to identify how much state funding each of the capital projects in that budget could qualify for from us in order to assess what the overall need in the program is. So in FY25 and prior, prior years, the fact that the blue bars are higher than the light blue dots illustrates that the funds could be carried forward into future years and used in future allocations. But what we're seeing is over the next five years, this analysis projects a funding gap of nearly $300 million for all projects provided in those budgets. Now, as I mentioned, we know that agencies are not going to request this full amount because agencies are aware of our funding limitations, um, especially for large capital infrastructure projects. And a lot of those agencies are currently actively pursuing other funding sources that will lower the state's participation in big projects. They will need to seek federal, other state programs, and really other local funds also to support those very big projects. Um, even so, even with those caveats, this is our best snapshot of how state resources compare to state the scale of transit needs statewide uh, that really that qualify for our program. And so, yes, over the next five years, we are projecting a funding gap of two hundred and ninety two million dollars. And that's for all future needs, including state of good repair, minor enhancements and major expansions in the program. And so the next slide looks at a. a, 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 a different future scenario where we only concentrate on state of good repair needs. So this is the exact same chart as before through FY25, but the projection only includes the costs associated with state of good repair needs in the future years. Years, And so even when we eliminate all of the expansion projects in the five-year budgets, we are still projecting a funding gap of about $92 million of for projects that our agencies have told us they will need using our standard match rates within the program. And every year it's a little lumpy. Um, there's not a clear growth in need every year because our agencies have different vehicle replacement schedules and those vehicles come up at different times. Also, of course, a capital a large capital infrastructure project would only incur costs over between one and three years usually. And so the program has spikes and dips, but in general, about $100 million of, of, uh, of gap exists here. Um, so next slide, please. And then we'll pause for more discussion. There's uh, one more additional complication within our funding programs that could put additional pressures on the capital program, as I mentioned a few slides ago, and that's a projected federal funding gap for our rural transit program. Uh, so though rural agencies compete for both capital and operating funds, 
we see this shortfall impacting the capital program for now because DRPT has some leeway on match rates within that program for rural entities. So um, I will just go over each of these points here to get to the final point, which is which is the 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 why it is putting pressure on the program. So the the rural transit program is supported with federal and state funding programs. The federal program, the main one that supports that is the FTA 5311 formula funding program. And on the state side, we support these agencies with merit operating assistance, merit capital assistance and our special programs. Uh, within the two big capital and operating areas, uh, federal funds have historically provided the majority of state support. So for capital projects, our standard match rate is that we provide 80% in 5311 uh, capital, 16% in state merit funding, and then 4% is the responsibility of the local jurisdictions and agencies. Within the operating program, this is a little less clear just because of the look back and the, how the cap works. But in the operating program, we generally give agencies 50% of the their projected operating costs for the next year. They get between 25 and 30% state on average through the operating assistance formula. And then the remaining 20 to 25% is on the locals to provide. And that 25 to 30% state is from the merit operating assistance program. It's in competition with all of the other agencies statewide. Within that rural transit program, they are facing new specific pressures that are um, unique to that program. So the US Census last year introduced changes that shifted two previously urban agencies into the rural area, but notably our federal appropriation has not increased at the same pace as the need has shifted over. In addition, the cost increases for capital and operating expenses in, in uh, these jurisdictions are impacting their, their funding profiles and there's new interest from new localities. And so all of those pressures are, are, uh, are, are pushing DRPT to, um, to, I guess, uh, recognize that our federal funding in that program may not cover as much as it has historically. So starting in FY26, we will likely not have sufficient federal funds to continue providing those high federal match rates in the capital program that we've done historically, which means that we will likely need to adjust and provide a higher share of state dollars uh, in for those projects to be fair with how other agencies receive the maximum amount as well, uh, that puts more pressure on the capital assistance program. Essentially more capital dollars, state capital dollars will likely go to rural uh, capital projects in the future. And so this, in addition to, you know, kind of coming back down to these more realistic predictable levels, uh, will add another kind of wild card to the mix within this program. And I will pause there. I think we can go to the next slide because I think it's, uh, yeah, this is the discussion time. I'm happy to address any questions you will have about the slides, but that is our overall outlook for the next five years. Thanks very much, Dan. And uh, it, can I ask if anybody has any uh, comments or questions that they'd like to pose? I have one, uh, Chairman McGlynn. Um, Dan, one quick clarification on that last point about the um, 5311 program. Yeah. I'm assuming the two charts on the prior two slides did not reflect that potential federal shortfall. So what was shown on those two charts, I guess really is the best case scenario and it could be, um, could look a lot worse if that last bullet comes to fruition. Am I correct in that assumption? That is correct. Uh, a lot worse. I don't. I, I. I don't know. I mean, so in looking at the numbers, and and Jayla, you can go back one more slide here. Uh, for for or actually go back one more from here. Um, for the full projection of all needs, um, this would likely have an impact of between ten and fifteen million dollars each year in the state program. And so the increase 
gap, funding gap next year could go from 39 million to 50 million or so. It's it's not a huge amount, but it is mm-hmm. significant. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we reduce the expansion projects, um, most rural capital projects are not expansion projects. And so on the next slide, um, most of them are also included on this projection. Uh, if you if you could go forward one slide, please. So yeah, that gap next year of seven million dollars could increase to a gap of of fifteen to twenty million dollars, I would say. Um, but yeah, it's these are all also based on these five year budgets provided that we you know we we ask and we work with our agencies to make sure that they are realistic, especially in the short term. Uh, but as we all know, transit's priorities can shift. Um, and uh, local politics and local funding dictates what people ask for in a given year. And so these, these are all best guess estimates. Okay, thank you, Dan. Other questions or comments? Let, let me offer one uh, from a CTV perspective, and I appreciate uh, the opportunities through this committee to learn more about what is going on in this area that is important to many people, serves many people in in various ways. Uh, This is unfortunately uh, too familiar of a story at all levels of transportation and and certainly beyond transportation. Uh, We just had to appropriate earlier this year $100 million be able to continue the existing asphalt work across the Commonwealth because of the great increases in cost. Uh, This Mm -hmm. this was not doing more work. This was to meet the uh, expenses of work already on the agenda. I think that what we are hearing here in some respects is (laughs) You know, the old saying, everybody wants to go to heaven and nobody wants to die. Uh, (laughs) And that's kind of what we're hearing in in many of our programs uh, as sources of revenue is declining and cost of operating and capital is greatly expanding. And I think we're going to have to all uh, talk with our members of the legislature to number one, help them understand what is happening. And number two, encourage them at the state level to address this. Now, very few people are in favor of higher taxes. I think we all understand that. But I think relatively few people are also going to be in favor of the service reductions that are going to be absolutely necessary if we don't. Uh, so uh, I certainly encourage all of us to speak with our legislators to help them understand the dilemma that is before us. And at the end of the day, uh, a significant part of addressing that is going to be in their hands. I think also at the local level, we're going to need to be advocates for these programs in, in having additional local funding provided uh, in, in order to address not having to reduce the level of service that uh, in the uh, <laughs> drunken sailor funding years uh, uh, of this early decade when there was so much money floating around at the federal level, uh, that's going away. Uh, most all of it is going away. Uh, and the federal deficit, in, in my view, is out of control. And and now we're uh, having to to deal with this. And it's going to be tough, folks, I think, to uh, continue programs even at that current level. But we all need to be strong advocates for it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Smith. I think those are important points uh, that that you're making and uh, certainly a a significant uh, challenge for us and for our colleagues, uh, both in the transit industry and local governments and uh, uh, the business community and um, riders to make that case uh, uh, very strongly. So I appreciate your, your bringing those uh, to our attention. 
Um, Dan, I had a, a couple of things that I was just kind of curious if we we're able to um, uh, provide this kind of information. Do we have a, a, a kind of um, a range of how much of the revenue that, um, is coming from fares? I assume it you know, starts at uh, those fare-free systems that, that's now down to zero or close to it. Uh, but uh, um, what, how high do we get in terms of the share of costs carried by um, riders and uh, uh, whether there's kind of average for that? And so, yeah. secondly, on the other question I, I would have is whether we have or should be collecting information about uh, the share of population and communities that are um, served by transit uh, as it changes over time. Thank you for those two questions. They're very good questions. Um, uh, to the first one about about essentially an analysis of statewide fare collection, we have not done a an analysis of statewide fare collection for for some time to uh, to put those figures together. Um, however, our agencies do report that information to us through their audited financials on an annual basis. And so, if it is something that this committee is interested in, uh, we can certainly look into it. Thanks. Thanks. Um, and uh, on the other side of it, uh, you know, we are hearing a lot of uh, interest in expanding services into um, uh, suburban areas surrounding uh, some of our cities and uh, um, increasing rural access to, to transit as well. Uh, and again, line with uh, what Dr. Smoot was talking about, it's going to be important to point to uh, the fact that this is a service that people are looking for. Uh, and uh, that may be serving more and more of uh, the Commonwealth citizens. And to the to the latter point of kind of demographic analysis about about who is currently served by transit, we look at that kind of data all the time for various different purposes, mm -hmm. and we have access to that data. So if if there is some specific or there are some specific points that you you would like us all to summarize uh, for this committee, we we are happy to look into that further. Thanks. Other questions or comments? And j j just quickly, you know, I think we need to keep before us, and, and certainly we do at the CTB, that many of these services, not all of them, many of them, are in essence a service of last resort to the person who is using them. And generally speaking, these are not people who can afford other options. Uh, no, very few people ride the bus, for example, simply because they want to take an excursion around the community. If they do want to do that, they if they can afford it, they will do it in their private vehicle. But people need the bus, and, and, and we need people riding the bus to get to work, just as they need to get to work. And I think we have to keep before us uh, the service dimension of what many of these transit services provide to the people in our community. Good point. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, could I, I'd, I'd love to see if other members of the committee have any uh, reaction to the letter. I think it was circulated while we were on uh, during the meeting. Uh, relating to the question about shifting some of the trip funds and also addressing uh, maybe treating light rail and bus uh, separately. I was just curious as to whether other right. committee members had any reaction to that. Yeah, I wonder if we could maybe just have uh, um, uh, Zach or, or um, Dan or, or Grant, somebody talk about uh, a little bit about uh, how the agency um, uh, views these questions, uh, whether we have discretion on those matters. And, and so forth uh, before we um, uh, move on to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to to pipe in for a second. So we, um, yeah, we received just a, you know, after meeting was set up and the agenda and everything went out, um, we had a, an agency contact us, um, you know, about all the concern about some of the operating and stuff that uh, you know, had been going down over time. And um, so there was just a, a request, I guess, to look at whether we should consider light rail for, you might call it like a carve out type of thing or something like that, because it doesn't necessarily fit the same 
um, you know, the framework as, as bus transit does. And then, um, you know, just do various discussions with, with folks. There are excess trip funds due to the fact that, uh, you know, some of what trip was aimed at changed tremendously over, uh, you know, during, th oh, due to COVID, you might say. So um, those are just some of the, and some of the things that have been brought up, um, you know, at this meeting, we we really wanted to, uh, you know, kind of hit at the agenda. But, uh, you know, this is something that if we did want to look at uh, carving out a particular type of service or something, that's 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 going to take some real thought, uh, you know, because we already are having a shortfall even in the in the things that we're given to traditional transit. So it's whether, um, you know, that is something we, we want to consider or not. So that's that's one point, Mr. Dyke, that I that I really didn't make when I gave my introductory remarks is that, you know, it's, we talked with this about some rail providers. Uh, one of our rail programs that also is, you know, has has a little gap between demand and, and funding. And and it's good that we have such a stable, you know, it used to be we had to compete, transportation had to compete with everything else. It's good we have this stable program that has this waterfall from all the transportation funds. But, um, you know, again, it doesn't allow as much flexibility as some people want. So it's stable funding, but, you know, it's just it doesn't always have the flexibility. You get what you get. When one person gets more, another another agency is going to get less. So those are some of the, you know, there's, there's trade offs to everything. And that's sort of the trade off here. But um, yes, there was just uh, something sent out for the members to consider about potential light rail and then potentially trip funds. So. Um, and uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Mester had her, her hand up. Yes. Mm -hmm. that, Thank you. And I appreciate Mr. Dyke's question. I will say I'm not ready to answer anything concretely to the letter, having just received it and um, having absorbed it while absorbing a shortfall presentation on our funding. Right, right. The shortfall um, presentation was what we really wanted to get across to this meeting. Yeah, yeah. I would say that, that holistically, not the um, specific request, but just overall on this process, I think we're successful in getting past money and keeping money because we have this holistic, transparent, very specific process, performance-based. So yes, you know, for that component, it goes up and down based on the pot and performance. And I think all of that is good and we need to retain the integrity of that. I do think there have been times where specific carve outs like WMOD and VRE made sense. So I'm not opposed to looking at it. I think we need to do that, as Zach said, deliberatively and with intention. Um, but I almost think that maybe more is that we keep looking at is the percentage of trip the right amount, or do we need to really look as um, my fellow TESDEC members have said, is there enough money? Is that because of the cost going out, is that the real issue we need to look at versus maybe another carve out? The points probably raised in the letter, uh, which I skim, probably speak to those larger issues. And of course, they're tying it to their specific um, uh, agency. But I'd like to look at it more holistically and deliberatively and maintain the, the values and the integrity of the system that's been in operation for a decade. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, well, that that all that all makes sense, I, and I I think uh, uh, what I would like to see is uh, you know getting the best input from uh, DRPT as to your thoughts on this in the uh, in the context that Cindy just outlay outlined, and so at least we can begin thinking about it. Obviously, we don't need to respond to it today, but I just want to make sure that we're 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 looking at issues out there and uh, thinking about them and 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 trying to come up with some new ideas and new approaches if necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we can all agree that uh, one of the um, uh, biggest obstacles we face is simply that, uh, like everything else, uh, we are facing uh, shortfalls. And, and yeah. that mm -hmm. means under this system that uh, there are um, potentially winners and losers. Um, you know, it's not just that you don't grow as fast as some other places. Uh, money um, is going to be reduced in some places and increased in others based on the, the performance, uh, which was our charge to come up with a, uh, a formula for uh, encouraging um, more efficiency, more success, more expansion of, of service and so forth. So that's, that's, a, that's the real challenge. I guess um, 
uh, as we start to review the um, the performance uh, of this system, uh, it is important for us to think about um, how we um, uh, address the question of the adequacy of resources. Um, and uh, again, uh, you know, we're sort of dealing with a unicorn uh, in terms of the tide. I mean, it's not exactly like VRE. It's not exactly like uh, uh, um, Metro. It, it, it's it's different, um, uh, and it's something that uh, seems you know to have a, a very strong uh, a positive impact. Um, uh, and you know, how, but how does it fit into a system really designed around our bus systems? I think Cindy had her hand up again. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to add to that. I think that prioritization is really important and looking at the environment. Um, TRIP is a great program, for example, and it had specific needs, and now we added the, the bus shelter, um, bus stop piece to it. But why do we have extra money? So it's sort of that analysis piece um, that would be helpful for DRPT to do, adding to the work that's already been done for today. If the environment changed enough and the needs are changed or the just the cost expenses or, John, as you said, the you know, it's a different animal and it doesn't quite fit, then we look at it holistically, but in the priorities in the whole picture. So thanks for letting me add that additional piece. Yeah, and also in that context, I think the point that was made earlier, people are going to have to look at what level of services do we really want and what do we have to do in order to pay for those? And there's going to be some some tough questions that have to be raised and debated, but you know that that's what we're here for, I guess, is to raise those and to and to and to try to discuss them and consider some options. I, um, I want to make sure that everybody on the uh, on the committee has an opportunity to to weigh in on any of these questions. Uh, uh, so, no Noel, did you want to add anything? Um, uh, I think the uh, these questions actually were raised by your agency. Um, uh, yes, they were, and it's I'm in a unique situation because I'm representing VTA, sure. but I work for HRT. Um, but mm -hmm. I think the issue is twofold. I mean, not discussing, not going down the LRT path, but talking about the um, adequacy of funding. You know, we have a short-term issue, and we have excess trip funding, and whether or not that those funds could be allocated in the short term, you know, re reallocated to fill some of the cuts that agencies are facing. And then we have a long-term situation of is there adequacy in the form in the program? Is, is there overall funding in the future? And I think it's two issues. I think we need to look at both of those issues. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Noel. How about Brian? Did you want to add anything? Um, no, I don't have anything else to really add. I think everyone else has summarized what comments I did have. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Kate, did you want to add anything? Um, just only to add a further point, I think it'd be very helpful to hear from DRPT what is uh, what is available, what flexibility is available within existing law to be moving funding over as this mm -hmm. happens. Because for if the trip law is restrictive that we can't do anything, that's important for us to know. If it's something that can happen administratively, then I think that's a, an important conversation to have moving forward. Thanks, Kate. And uh, Jamie? Uh, no comments from me. OK. Jim, did you have anything else to add? Nope. Dr. Smoot? He may have had to leave, I believe, if he's not. OK. All right. That's now, so that's maybe, maybe he'll chime up in a second, but I think he may have had a conflict at about 1130. So he might have. He's a wanted okay. man. There it is. And uh, Cindy, anything else? Not for me. I thought I had my hand down. I do see a hand up for okay. Valerie, Thank maybe you. as an attendee. Uh, but... So that... <laughs> that might be nice. Well, so we'll finish up with the, the discussion then and uh, move on to public hearing. Uh, do we have any um, indication of people who would like to participate in public hearing? Yeah, um, Dr. McGlynn and I can help lead this um, discussion and direct traffic here. I, 
If I can first just say I, I can address Kate's question. Um, so the Code of Virginia does give DRBT some flexibility to move money from the capital program over to operating and also from the what is deemed the special two and a half percent of the Commonwealth Mass Transit Fund over to um, over to operating as well. Um, we do not have the ability, the authority to move money from TRIP um, out of that program anywhere else. All right, um, I know uh, Mr. Smith over at um, Hampton Roads Transit had contacted us before the meeting. Um, so um, if you want to speak, just raise your hand and then you'll have the ability to un unmute yourself. Um, but I'll turn it over to Mr. Smith. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Yep. Great, well, thank you and good morning everyone. Uh, just appreciate the opportunity to share some comment and really following on a lot of the dialogue that's already happened this morning. Um, and I really appreciate as well, you know, just a, it's the labor of love I know among TISDAC and also DRPT and others who are on the call today. So I just really appreciate everybody's um, devotion to, to, to everything here. Um, I guess my uh, comments will be really uh, following on the letter that's been referenced. Um, and again, following on the discussion that's happened this morning, the projected operating revenues um, not keeping pace with cost growth and a real concern. I know it's a shared concern statewide about stability and sufficient year to year funding for statewide operating support. Um, and so uh, while TISDAC has, has been noted as, is, you know, charged specifically with looking at the performance metrics within the operating, you know, nonetheless, it's uh, really appreciate the attention to the holistic, uh, you know, you know, everything across the board. And um, so I'll, I guess my comments will be more on a structural sort of policy level and, and, and again, referencing the two items that were mentioned in the, in the letter uh, to the chair and, and to Mr. Trogdon. Um, again, the, the first one is, is just stability in the statewide operating program. And in this environment that we're in um, and, and looking at the TRIP program, uh, in particular, because there are significant unallocated balances in the TRIP program, I think right now, and, I, and I'm basing this off information from DRPT, but if I miss, uh, miss this in some way, that, that's certainly on me. I believe it's, it's upwards of $30 million right now of unallocated TRIP funding. Um, and then after multi-year commitment funds are, are obligated, it's still in the range of 26 to, to $30 million of unallocated TRIP funding. You know, meanwhile, we've we've all seen the, the charts that project, um, you know, the the downward pressure on the statewide operating support. So, you know, in this environment, as you know, I can speak for HRT, uh, and I, I, I believe you know many around the Commonwealth. We're all still laboring to recover in this post-pandemic and sort of reestablish ourselves in whatever the new normal is. And so to be in a to be in a, a forecast where we may continue to see decreased state operating support is is very very challenging. So, you know, again, it's a trade off here. And, and even as Zach sort of and I appreciate the way that that the meeting was even kicked off, sort of framing up the the overall concerns. You know, what we're living with is largely based upon the percentages uh, as they're established in the code, and then you know the allocation of funding. That, that starts with the percentages of the Commonwealth Mass Transit Fund. And of course, you know, the, the, the TRIP program uh, is, is established. And I want to say too, the, the TRIP program is very important. It's a great program, very important program. But, it, you know, in this environment and, and, and really even ongoing is a 6% of the Commonwealth Mass Transit Fund, you know, the appropriate level of, of for the TRIP program when you balance that against the other needs that that agencies are experiencing. So, you know, that's a long way of saying, you know, you know, very, very uh, much interested in looking at those unallocated balances in the TRIP program and uh, seeing what could be done, um, you know, particularly around FY26, but but maybe just in this bridged period of time, why, because it's not until as, as um, 
Dan mentioned it won't be until next year that that the committee looks at the performance factors and sort of starts doing their three year evaluation. So, you know, maybe, maybe things would be adjusted in the future, but in the meantime, these unallocated trip balances seem to be something that uh, could be considered. Um, my, my second comment, and I'll try to be brief here, it, it, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, kind of going back to the future a little bit, but uh, I think most TISDAC members may, may recall in 2018, uh, you received a similar letter from VRE at the time, the chair of VRE, just highlighting the unique uh, characteristics of VRE and that the belief that, you know, it, it really should not be treated the same as um, bus, you know, rubber wheel modes in the overall merit program. And to TISDAC's credit and to DRPT's credit, there was some real intentionality of effort. And that is what led to the creation of a separate pool of funding within the merit program for VRE. Um, you know, fast forward a little bit to today in FY25, of course, VRE is now allocated up to 3.5% of the Commonwealth Mass Transit Fund. It was sort of recognized, you know, with the pandemic really sh further shed a light on the fact that VRE sort of stood out as an odd, uh, you know, mode within what otherwise is mostly a bus program. Uh, we would say very much the similar phenomena apply to light rail. So we just want to draw, that's the, as you see in the letter there, we're drawing attention to, to light rail and uh, the fact that, you know, it, a, a belief it does not belong in the merit program as, as it is today, that in fact, you know, we could go as far back as when performance-based funding was first being um, evaluated to implement in Virginia, uh, many will recall that SJR uh, 297 uh, body of work. And at that time, you know, so this is going back from the very beginning of these issues, it was recognized that rail properties do not belong in the same sort of performance-based allocation approach as as rubber wheel modes. And, and you know, the follow-on work that even came after that study continued to acknowledge that performance factors, uh, whatever they may be, um, they only make sense when they are applied within similar and among similar modes. So when you have something like light rail that has a significantly different cost structure, um, significant different types of capital and operating uh, characteristics, it very much like VRE, WMATA rail, uh, and in fact, and the tie, those were the three rail properties that were identified as being unique and that should not be treated the same as other modes. So, um, you know, we would put those out there as you've already discussed some today. We'd look forward. I'd, I'd volunteer that um, maybe I think it would maybe appropriate that at HRT just reach out directly to DRPT and we, we could sit down with um, Zach and his team and, and start to look at this in a little more detail and be able to share more information with everybody going forward. But those are the two basic things. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much, Brian. Appreciate it. Do we have any other comment? Well, there was a, a, a Valerie Kramer. I'm not sure um, where she yeah. went in terms of her hand going up. Yeah, so just a reminder to everybody across the top of your screen, you'll see a, a little hand that says raise. Um, just click on that um, and we'll acknowledge you and then you'll be able to unmute yourself. But um, I'm not seeing anyone else raising their hand. All right. Well, if that's the case, um, we'll close the public hearing and uh, turn to the uh, director. Um, Zach, if you would uh, give us an up, uh, uh, a kind of uh, <laughs> next steps and wrap up for this meeting. Um, sure, sure. I know we're, we're, we're getting close on time. Um, so this was a little bit, I guess, off cycle for us um, because we, we uh, you know, wanted to get you all together and, and we appreciate you all on short notice getting together. I mean, we normally don't Kind of get together in the summer, talk about how the SIP went, and we'll get together in the spring to talk about how the SIP's going to go. Um, but this was this was sort of off cycle because we did have these concerns raised, and um, you know wanted to reiterate where we were at with um, what we saw as as funding allocations moving forward. Um, you know, I guess what I would say about what DRPT can do is that, and, and Andy can certainly step in here too that. Um, I think we're going to be looking to 
who the stakeholders that you all represent as part of TISDAC to also uh, kind of be those voices to, you know, if you talk about legislative uh, approaches and stuff like that, that that's, uh, we're, we're, we'll provide information, you know, and we will, we will work together, um, but we're not necessarily going to advocate and, and things right. of that nature. So that's where, you know, the, the, the folks that you all represent on TISDAC here, you know, kind of has to take those, those batons and run with them and, and, you know, we're, we'll work together with you all on that. So, um, so, um, you know, when we get together next, uh, you know, Andy put up what the next step will be. We'll, we'll certainly be looking um, if we can uh, find money. You know, I hate to say that. I mean, we are always working to deobligate projects and, and such and find funding that we can, you know, maybe not be put into productive use or is not needed to put it back into the program to shore it up. And and we've been successful with that for the last couple of years. And um, you know, we can't always promise that that'll happen, but we'll we're always looking at that. So that that will certainly be part of our strategy in 26 um, to help to uh, provide stable funding. We were able to stabilize it in 25, at least to some degree. And so um, we certainly uh, will try to do that again as 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 um, as possible. Um, and then, of course, we talked to you about the 5311 funding, which you all don't necessarily have much uh, to do with, but um, it certainly is all part of the same. You know, it's all connected. So. Mm -hmm. one, one one part sneezes, the other catches cold, right? As they say. So, uh, um, and then uh, you know, certainly with the funding that that goes to uh, you know Wamata in Northern Virginia, we we are working very closely with a lot of them. There's a whole lot going on up there, which I'm sure all of you are aware of. But Kate and her team and and Cindy and her folks are all just. I mean, they are they are busy, busy, busy with all the things going on. We're working hand in glove with them. Um, so, as I said, lots of times we'll get together back in the spring. I don't know. Um, I'll, you know, certainly y'all can make comments after me about whether there's anything else in terms of uh, what you just talked about that you all would want to get together to talk about again, or whether you want to re return to your respective organizations to do these things. Um, but again, normally we ask you all to get together again in, in the spring, um, probably in person to um to talk about what it looks like for the upcoming sip and how the formula has has uh performed so um uh and then there's a couple more comments there but that's that's my sort of disjointed uh wrap up of things <laughs> for how, how it's been going so uh happy for any questions or other comments as well okay thank you very much zach for that um anybody have any comments and reaction if not, let, let me thank uh, the staff, uh, Dan, uh, for your presentations and, and uh, Andy and Grant uh, uh, for all the work that you're doing, Tiffany. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Zach, thank you for your leadership uh, here. And we, I think we understand that the agency itself um, is charged with the responsibility of implementing the decisions made by the General Assembly and the governor. Um, uh, and uh, we have the opportunity as a an advisory group to uh, uh, point to some issues and concerns that uh, uh, I think are, are very much um, uh, in line with uh, what our responsibilities are. So uh, I would you. encourage us to think about that. Um, any Anybody have anything else that they'd like to bring to us to today? If not, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. moved. Okay, all in favor, Thank please you. say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Okay. Thanks very Take much. Care, everybody. Everybody. Thanks. Take care. Have a great day. Stay Thank safe. You. Thank you.